non-speaker, when we have individuals from Eastern countries trying to travel to Western democracies and they get held at airports, when they get held at embassies, when their visas get denied for no apparent reason, or they have to go for extensively long interviews, or then they disappear for two or three weeks and then come back under the Patriot Act. Do you think there's something wrong with that? We think that it's unfair, we think it's illegitimate, it thinks it damages the West, it damages the West and our the top people. And we think it's just a really bad thing. So in open government, we're going to tell you about like, three main things. First of all, we're going to tell you why this is morally abhorrent and why we think we should definitely be changing this. Then we're going to tell you the effects of it being morally abhorrent and, effect, and why that means that we, that the West, isn't able to make the changes that it'd like to and it causes the problems in the first place. And thirdly, we're going to talk about how we actually don't gain any information from these kind of places, uh, from these kind of actions, and how they are effective in the first place. So first of all, on to my main argument, right? <coughs> Why is this a moral problem, right? Because we say, like, at the moment, what we have, what happens in the West is waterboarding. We send people to Montana. Anyway. We say that in these kind of instances, we break lots of human rights. We break the right to bodily autonomy. We break the right to privacy. We say that the only grounds that we do this on is for some idea of security. I'll tell you why that doesn't last. It lasts later. But moreover, we think that these human rights can be broken at certain points. We say that they are. Uh, uh, I'm not able to describe it. Aren't there other times and other situations that we use coercion other than just tourists and travellers coming through? Or are you only thinking about tourists and travellers coming through airports who get nicked the Patriot Act? Okay, so like, we think that there might be other scenarios where it's done. We think when it's arbitrarily done because someone's a foreign citizen, uh, as stated in the motion, but we have a problem with that, right? Uh, we think that those are the kind of situations that we want to talk about. We want to be talking about. But we think that that's an arbitrary distinction at the end of the day. I think the principle of human rights and how they work is it's based on you being a fucking human, right? It doesn't matter if that means whether you come from an eastern state or a western state. We think that when you break, the, when you go things, when you take people through certain actions, you like demean them, you demoralize them, and you tell them ultimately at the end of the day that they're not wanting to be safe or feel comfortable in these situations. You know, we also have a lot of problems with domestic, domestically why, why individuals are like. We think that morally, because you're meant to be treating everyone as a human in these situations, but any compromise of these, but any compromise of this, we break the point, we break, break the point of these rights, and we, uh, thank you, and we go to the session. We do the key principles offer us, uh, the key principles that uphold the West, we want to talk to other places, is those human rights. We say we deny them all, uh, we, we say we come across being hypocritical, but what we don't. Why is that a problem, right? Because we say that, like, the only reason we do this is because we're scared of terrorist threats or we're scared of like homeland attacks. We say that the reason that those narratives grew or become larger and larger is because of this very hypocrisy that we gain. Where we claim to have a moral high ground but allows us to intervene in certain situations and allows us to use human rights councils to like or, uh, to offer sanctions to other countries, yet at the same time we still practice these same things. We think that's massively like uh, it's something about really hinders our ability to uh, negotiate with these individuals, and it also feeds into their narrative, which means that these attacks happen in the first place. We think the only thing that we're going to have to do is to like stop doing this, so that the attacks become less, so that people so that we can negotiate and make stuff better outside of the house, right? Moving on to my third point about why we get like no information from this, and it's actually not a necessity, right? So is it like on our side of the house, we're still happy for like what we do to normal citizens to be done to foreign citizens. So we don't think the NSA or GCHQ is going to stop using its dragnets, or we will, or we will be able to stop doing the surveillance that we do normally. So we think that they work quite effectively in themselves. But we also say, right, foreign citizens aren't normally the ones that are, like, are calling terrorists. So we look at like the same, uh, we look at like the bombings that happened in London, right? We look at like the individuals that They all came from Leeds, right? They were all individuals that were like born in the country and bred in the country. We think that they don't fall into the same house. They wouldn't have been. They don't get. There's no difference in the outside emotion. Why is that the case, right? Because like we think that we already have some kind of, uh, we already uh, take some distinction of otherism with foreign citizens, so that we already look like in a different way. No, but also foreign citizens probably feel like they need to earn their right to be in those kind of situations, so they're less susceptible to like bang into the courts when they come to places. No, but like, when foreign citizens come to this country, they try not to go to the safe places where they're already aware of a when the culture exists, but try to like earn their place as being that US citizen or being that British citizen, so they're not likely to like be swayed into this. But more than that, like you need to have a really deep understanding of the systems or like be quite embedded to get the kind of things that they're talking about in the first place, right? You can't just come as a foreign citizen and be like, oh, I'm an like, I don't know, Uranium or Semtex, right? What you have to be is someone that's like well ingrained into like some chemical industry or working at a chemical, uh, or working into kind of factory that can build up on that, that can actually go in and get the kind of stuff. We say that also, right, it's ineffective because like coercion doesn't always work, right? Coercion is like falsely, uh, 
collision is like can, can, can unfortunately be like associated with entrapment, right? We say, but what happens is when you try and coerce someone into a situation where they're not going to behave that way at all, you're already put the bias on them in that situation. We think in those kinds of in those kind of areas, you're trying to push someone to do something really bad and treat them already as though they've done something wrong, just so you can hold them accountable. Why? Because at the end of the day you can say that you're 43 out of 44 terrorist plots were foiled by like MI6 when actually in real fact they weren't, they were just 43 out of 44 people we sent back because we weren't sure and how I would say we could be on that. Yeah. Is offering a visa to one Chinese person in exchange for, uh, for them giving us additional information about something that we require the information of, a form of coercion that you find reasonable or not? Okay, so we don't think that's reasonable, but we have to be able to spy on other people, right? We think the second that we do that, and we say about citizenship, or we say about like, because you're treating this someone different, we want information, then that's a good thing. It's anything that we don't call, right? We think that in those kind of situations, you're just doing arbitrary, you're still doing morally, arbitrarily deciding that that person, or that citizen, is valued more or less because of that, and therefore we can take more information. We don't think that's cool, right? I think that's also coercion in the sense that because you're falsely <coughs> setting them up to give us information, we're not always certain that information is correct, right? We say that on our side of the house, that information is probably not worth it. There's other means for us to get that information by negotiations with those people and getting more out of them. So because like moral because morally like is just abhorrent that we still do have these practices. Because on top of that, we think that it undermines our ability to like stop terrorism uh, stop terrorist uh, uh, terrorism growing in the first place because we don't actually get any information from it. It has no benefits whatsoever. For all those reasons, we're really proud of terrorists. Thank you for that speech. That's quite a big During my speech, I'm going to talk about the idea specifically why West talk about what's the idea of deception and spying, why we do it in the first place now. And then I'm going to talk about why the concept of foreign citizens does not change when it comes to deception, when it comes to spying, and why that's basically the same as we do with domestic uh, citizens. So the, the, the concept of foreign citizens is not as important as the proposition brought us. Before that, some points of rebuttal. So basically, what we heard from the proposition is that this is morally bad and the human rights and the, the, the threat to the, to the right of privacy. We say that also when it comes to spying, we also do it in the, in the real world legally, right? So even when there's a necess necessity, we still do it, and every, everyone seems to agree that it's fine to spy once we have an outcome that we want to get, but it has to go through law. So the right of privacy actually is at some point breaking because for a greater good. And we say that not necessarily just because you're spying someone that's very bad, because once you see that the outcome saving lives or security issues, sometimes that's reasonable. And we, we haven't heard enough from the proposition to say as why specifically uh, the Western state should be the one not to control about and why specifically the foreign citizens always are uh, targeted. We say that in the idea of uh, Western state, we see that they're most targeted by the, uh, the foreign citizens in the sense of terrorism. The terrorist groups, we see that the attacks that happen, for example, in Paris, in London, in Madrid, in the US, these are the countries in which are, are actually now holding and trying to have this world peace and are the most effect and having more attempt uh, to have security in the world. We see that the terrorist group, not necessarily countries from uh, others than Western states, but citizens <laughs> Outside of, uh, United, outside of the Western state are the biggest threat because we see the terrorist group, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, in which it's very, very important that the, uh, the right of privacy when it's come to uh, comparison with, uh, with the lives of people that have been killed during this attack cannot be uh, totally balanced and say, because of the right of privacy, we cannot do this. Now, going to that uh, third point that we have, basically they say that there's no information gained because of this, but there's no reason for us to say we're not going to do that. Even if there's a slight chance that by doing so we might get information, we say that that's very important. What happened with the Snowden case 
is that him, even though this is not the case of foreign citizen having deception to gather information, still through deception, sending a fake email that would gather the information from the NSA, happened to uh, happen to gather information what the NSA and some other uh, intelligence agencies have done. That's been very helpful in diplomatic issues in the sense of relieving the, the truth. I'm not saying that this is terrorist, uh, uh, terrorist uh, gathering information about terrorist attacks. I'm just saying that deception in this case have been proven successful that because through deception he made it possible to reveal information same as what have done in, uh, what uh, Julian Assange from WikiLeaks have done through deception that gathered information that revealed the rules. So in some cases truth is more important and if by truth we can save lives we say that deception or any other means of gathering information to save lives is reasonable. Yeah, great. If you can't get information from your own citizens with due process and court orders, would you be willing to coerce them into giving up this information as well for the sake of security? No, we're saying that the same thing happens also with the, uh, with the domestic uh, citizens. So the concept of foreign citizens just because they are foreign citizens, we cannot use deception. The same thing happens also with the uh, domestic citizens. Through not. We also have a court order, but not necessarily at all times. We have seen, uh, especially for example in UK, trying to force a law in which we're going to gather metadata in the sense of gathering information from all citizens and only in the case where those information match the suspicion that we have, we can look into it, but not necessarily uh, deprive the pri uh, deprive privacy and go into every specific case. So we see that, that uh, information intelligence gathering happens already without the court order, but when it comes to suspicion, and when it comes to uh, privacy of uh, personal uh, persons, it's only in the sense when there's suspicion uh, of a terrorist attack or a threat to national security, uh, a threat to citizen security. And we say that it's reasonable uh, to uphold at some point the right of privacy once we compare it to the, uh, to the right of, uh, to ensure security. So going to the idea of the why specifically was the state, as already mentioned, they are mainly targeted. I think they have a responsibility to maintain security. So not necessarily having the case, for example, uh, developing countries which are highly dependent on Western states. For example, in my case, it's Kosovo is like highly dependent from international uh, community. It is also international community in this in this sense, Western states to also ensure security because they've been part of the whole process of state building. And we say that even if we are foreign citizen, it's also their responsibility to ensure security and if that means by deception or by coercion then that's totally reasonable because they're mainly targeted from different terrorist groups from all over all over the world they are specifically targeted therefore they can and it's reasonable uh, to to do so the idea of the deception in the intelligence also matters in the sense of saving lives so we get the uh, if we get the example of for example 9 11 if we compare whether we would if we could have saved lives of the people who died in 9-11, should we, should have we used uh, any form of deception to gather information whether this terrorist attack is going to happen, or using coercion, or whatever way, just like the, uh, the PDPI uh, already suggested, like giving a benefit to someone for other information, to a foreign citizen to tell us if they have any information what's going to happen. We say that this, even though this might uh, seem morally wrong, once we compare to the lives to ensuring security, we say that this matters. Because when it's come to citizens, the state also has a responsibility to ensure security of its citizens. So it's the, it's the idea intervention that these states do abroad also threatens the uh, domestic, uh, the national security. And this means the citizens in the Western state are also threatened because their government has gone to war or at some point through the politics have created hatred at, or the other countries have created hatred, hate, created hatred towards them. So we see that in this case the government has a greater responsibility and specifically Western states because of intervention and the active role that they got to ensure or somehow to install uh, democracy. And the citizens deserve to have security and if this, this means that the state should use deception or somehow coercion to gather information so they can pro uh, provide uh, security and share security for its citizens, we say that it is totally uh, reasonable. The idea of globalization, the interconnection interceptions uh, that happen now in the in the world is very important to have the sense that the foreign citizen concept that his sovereign is not our citizen has been diminished because a lot of travel a lot of connections between states a lot of globalization we say that even though you're a foreign citizen it's still a potential threat everyone to everyone therefore we do not believe that the concept of foreign citizens should make any difference when it comes to gathering information the same as you do when it comes to domestic uh, national uh, people for this reason that get you a vote thank you
Right, so out of open opposition, what I seem to get from them is that they say that we should uh, deceive and coerce everyone, including our own citizens. Now, we just like to point out that that is like not something the most recent nation should do. Why? Because the fact is that the government does not like exist just to ensure that the citizens survive or like stay alive, right? Most of them do believe that we have certain rights, certain civil rights, which are meant to make sure that we thrive in life and are able to like go through our life with minimum interference, right? We think that is something that for myself. What I'm going to talk to you today is about the long-term harm this causes precisely because it is viewed as immoral, as after we brought to you and it was completely unresponded from the opposition. Three points today. Firstly, why it is chasing shadows and extremely ineffective, right? Secondly, how do you stop attacks, i.e. you actually need the cooperation of foreign governments, which is extremely hard to get at the point at which you're like coercing and torturing their citizens. And thirdly, I'll talk about the rise of ISIS, which is like quite an important actor in this debate, and how this is directly fueling their government efforts, which is like damaging for like the Middle East as well as like the West, right? But before that, I have like some points of the battle. So what out of closing opposition, what we just got is a point of information about like offering some additional incentives, right? Firstly, giving someone an additional incentive and a longer visa is not coercion. I, coercion tends to imply some sort of like coercive force, i.e. you are forcing them and using like probably physical harm, i.e. you are trying to take away something from them in order to get information rather than give them stuff, right? But even I think they are at their best, they may have been talking about deception, right? And in this case, we do think it's, it's ineffective. Why? Because at the point of which of give, offering someone something, it increases the chance that they're going to lie in order to get it right. We think that it's just counterproductive at the point at which your so-called information may or may not even be correct, right? and you have no way of telling. Uh, now, out of the question, what we just got is they seem to suggest that under our side of the house, we are going to stop like surveillance programs and drug nets, right? No, they are clearly pointed out that the things at the NSA are still going to continue. Why? Because they are not coercion or deception. The key point here is that these are passive forms of gathering information. They in no way alter the decision making of the people we're talking about on an active scale, right? Moreover, we think we do think that there is a certain scale of human rights, right? Like Passive spying is a quite a minimum invasion of privacy. What we're talking about here is when the government agent goes out and deliberately tries to violate the crime, deliberately tries to violate, violate the bodily autonomy of a foreign citizen. Right? We think that scale of harm is a lot more than like what they are talking about. Why? Because you are actually have physical, tangible effects on your body and like the way you act, right? And they also talk a bit about links. Look, Edward Snowden and Julian Assange um, were not. They are links, right? Links. It's not coercion or deception, it's just revealing the revealing what happened. Um, <coughs> moreover, on the last point of the battle, they talk a lot about citizens and foreigners and why they're the same, right? Here's the key distinction. A foreigner is more vulnerable than a citizen of a country when it comes to being coerced or deceived. Why? Because they frequently lack, they have less recourse to legal means, right? Most citizens of their countries do know like that they go to court because this happened to them and like they have access to it precisely because they're citizens when they are released. However, when you do go to a former national, quite frequently what happens after this is they get deported back to their home country. Note that when you're not no longer in like the West, it's extremely hard to like, get access to their courts because of like the barriers involved. You need to get your voice heard, you need to go back there. And when you do get challenged, it is quite easy for them to just deny it because like as they as they say, you're less you're less accountable to them for all the decisions they already said. No, thank you. But now moving on to my case substantive, the first point, chasing shadows. Here's the thing. At the point at which you receive or call someone, right, you are actively trying to alter that decision making framework. Why is this important? Because this implies that the common information you have on the activities is somewhat ambivalent and uncertain, but they may or may not be going like they can go either way. But at the moment at which you're actively trying to check whether they are they may pose a terrorist threat, you are you are making like 
you are just making the chance higher. Why? Because the most of the ways intelligence agencies do this is to try to like, encourage people if it's deception to come in and, and then they catch them. Like you, you just created your own trap, or in the form of coercion. Quite frequently, after you've been tortured for like one, two, or like six months, you usually just give in and just like tell them whatever you want just to get it to stop. Right? We think what frequently happens is you're just creating your own traps and just like chasing shadows. Oh, but on my second point on how to stop the yes. and this is where morality comes in, right? The most, if you don't want to stop terrorist attacks, what you're doing is like form an intelligence, right? Because even we, we think what, and when you need foreign intelligence, what you're doing is the cooperation of the foreign countries, I, because they're the ones who are closest to the ground and therefore tend to know the most, right? The problem is that most countries do not like it at the point at which you're coercing their citizens, right? Firstly, this causes public outcry in this country when they start, which like it eventually is, and at a point it becomes extremely hard for the government to continue justify, justifying like intelligence cooperation with someone who deliberately tortured their own citizens, right? So in the long term, that's a extreme. Um, moreover, the government is as the government will view this as an extremely hypocritical action, right? Which just makes it harder to cooperate in the long term because they do not think that you respect the rights of citizens anymore, right? So we think that's like kind of bad in the long term, and I'll take a point for our closing as well. Right. Given that it's the status quo, that Chinese governments offer money to um, Western citizens in, in turn change for intelligence, and Western governments offer money to Chinese citizens in turn to intelligence, like, this is just what happens, right? We don't think that that is the cause for a lack of cooperation um, on any issue thank between you, um, like, Ukraine and China. Bribery is not coercion or deception, right? It is giving money in exchange for information that's like transactional at best. That's just not part of the debate. What we're talking about is the point at which you're. Yeah, even, but move on to my final point on ISIS, which ties, which just brings everything we have said closer. Why is ISIS important? Firstly, because they're getting massive recruitment from foreign fighters, usually from the West. And secondly, because the threat of returning citizens can not domestic attacks is like kind of high, right? But how do they actually recruit people, right? They, their main recruitment message is the fact that you're joining a new employer's state. Right? They said that the West is corrupt, that the West no longer respects rights, and, the, and it's become inherently immoral. Right? One of the key ways they do this is to point to the fact that the West deceives and coerces people deliberately, especially for one citizens, and especially the ones who tend to be Muslim. Right? This, type of, this type of narrative is how ISIS has managed to recruit people precisely because, as Abdiya said, the West is now viewed as immoral and creating arbitrary distinctions on who and who, who they view as human. And <laughs> They confer human rights to us. We think that's just fundamentally damaging in the long term to the interests of the country. So I am extremely proud to propose. Speaker, uh, we had a case brought here by the opening government, which kind of interacts within the arguments that they brought. And I'm going to make, I'm going to point out some flaws that they have within their within their policy, within their motion, and explain to you that how some of the points that they brought here actually do not make sense. First of all, some points of answering. They have told us uh, during during the previous speech, we have heard that uh, we are going to get some long-term harms. And these are long term harms from, uh, from adopting for, by, by uh, keeping the deception and coercion of foreign citizens. And these long term harms are mostly the increase of hatred that happens within the countries of origin that these foreign citizens come from in the first place. So basically, what happens, uh, what, what the government is trying to explain to us is, is that by coercing foreign citizens and the information that comes out of these coercions and these deceptions become globally worldwide available and when countries of origin see the way that their foreign citizens are treated in these western countries then they, there is a public outcry in these countries therefore they get their hatred increased uh, basically this is a this is in, in in contradiction with the point that they said before that which is when they were talking about the differences when they're they were talking about the an answer to our point which is 
between the differences of foreign and local citizens and the way that they are treated. So basically, when they said that there is a difference between treating foreign and local uh, foreign and local citizens in the city in the first place, is that these uh, local citizens have a way of answering when some, something was done in the wrong way. They have a way of answering to the to the, to the government. They have a way of suing these uh, intelligence agency when these foreign citizens only go back to their countries and cry. First of all, this is not true, and it is in contradiction with what they're saying because they say that if something badly happens, then this information go worldwide and everyone and, and to every one of them is available. And secondly, they said that because they are defenseless, uh, because they are defenseless in a form, then we have to do something. Uh, we have to keep uh, to keep them protected as as a part of foreign citizens, which uh, also is something that uh, my, my partner explained to you before. We when when he was explaining the fact that these foreign citizens will get some form of reward for their uh, for their cooperation in this in these information gathering. So when it comes when it comes to idea of uh, of, of uh, hatred, which was one of the main points brought here by the government, when they were talking about this, uh, when they were when, when they brought the example of ISIS and they said that the massive recruiters that they got is because they explained the hatred that happens uh, in the Western countries, because uh, the, the way that the citizens are treated in the Western countries, they explained this chain, the, this chain, which actually, uh, the, which when they, when they, are, they are trying to explain because of the way that their citizens are treated in, 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 the, in the countries. First of all, the idea why hatred exists within Western and, and, and uh, Eastern countries is not because of the way that their citizens are treated in the Western countries, is because of the way, because first of all, because of the intervention that happened in the Middle East and Eastern countries, and secondly, because of the terrorist attacks that happen in these Western countries. My partner explained to you that how these Western countries are a target of terrorist attacks by these Middle East, by, by these Eastern countries, therefore they have an incentive towards this information gathering. They have a reason why they want to gather information in the first place from the citizens. So we do not have the need of forging some kind of trust with, the, with these foreign citizens in the first place when there is reason to believe that citizens coming from these foreign countries actually have incentives to hate the countries that they're going to. Before I move on to the next point, I'll take away. Your case of citizen protection relies on the idea that the person you are coercing has vital information or is responsible for terrorism. Why can't you use legal means in your state to actually withdraw that information by telling him he has to uh, do it because there is reasonable doubt that he is involved yes. in terrorism? Yeah, first of all, there, there, is, there is a problem within that. Uh, the, the, the idea that this information would, would, first of all, it would take much more time. And secondly, the idea that when you try to do it in a form of a legal way, you're, you, can, you can make sure that there are a lot of uh, problems and obstacles in, 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 in gathering these, these information, which I'm going to go through uh, a little bit later. So basically, when talking about the idea of, of the reason that why these Western, Western countries try these techniques of deception and coercion in the first place is because they do it for the, for the sake of security. And there is a clash of, of, of human rights, which was explained to you uh, by, my, by, by my partner, which is the idea of privacy versus security, which actually in this case uh, has a clash, of, a clash of human rights as well. When they were talking about that how humans have this body integrity and you cannot violate them by trying to deceive them through deception, through deception techniques in order to gather them information, we say that we do that these kind of deceptions in order to ensure that another human right is respected within the country that these techniques are happening in the first place, which is the right of the uh, which is the which is because of security and uh, which which is because of security and because these uh, because these countries have a reason to, to use these techniques in the first place. So basically, what what happens when, when there is successful information gathering is that in this in this aspect, what, uh, what the country assures is the, the much needed information in order to secure to secure that the national security of of this country is being is actually being as uh, is being upheld in that country. And basically, when when citizens go through this, when 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 we use these citizens, foreign citizens, in order to gather information, they, they we kind of can use other forms of deception, which they kind of be, because the government didn't actually explain what coercion was in the first place. Then they try to come up here and say that uh, there are passive forms of information gathering, which NSA does. And secondly, they say that if we want to force, uh, if, if if coercion in in this case should not be something when you want to give them a form of reward, because in that case. Uh, in that case, it's not direct deception, and they, they try to explain deception as a form of torture. 
Well, we believe, on the other hand, that any way, that any form of reward that you can give to a citizen, any form of reward that you can use in a way to deceive the citizen in order to give you the information, that is coercion, and therefore this information will be available to, to your country, even through giving, through giving rewards. We have a lot of examples, my partners may give you, that when you treat even foreign and local citizens in the same way, if, when you are deceiving a local citizen of your own country, and it happens that the citizen, you have abused some rights of the citizen, uh, maybe you have kept him in, in jail for a year, which was a mistake. Then there are forms that the state rewards the people for whom their rights were violated with no reason. So basically, we say that when we actually uh, abuse these foreign citizens in that way, that we break their rights and nothing we, you know, we gain nothing from them, there are forms of rewards for these people. Well, if we abuse these citizens and we actually get some very valuable information, then this means that the country has made the job of national security available. We believe that because there is, uh, because there is a need, and the, the state is held responsible, if anything happens within the country, it has the right to violate the privacy of its citizens and foreign citizens coming to the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. Please like to invite the new government. Thank you, Councillor. 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 Thank you,
we have a situation uh, where we need that information, then and it's actually is a situation that we can do it legally like we do it with all criminals and all crimes. We think that we have a system in order to have um, an idea of you know, prosecuting people, yes. of, of knowing whether they've done something wrong or right. If they try to prove us that terrorism is a like, separate case from that, then A, they need to prove that it's a separate case, not simply say that people are in danger. We think that it's not. We think that we initially thought that was, and we had Patriot Acts and all of these horrendous things tortured people. But we think that we, these things have changed, even the US have changed the Patriot Act to go further from those ideas, because we don't necessarily think that terrorism is different. We think that a lot of these choices were made by emotion. We don't actually think that it's different. We still need due process by that. And, and lastly, uh, when we asked the POI about why not do that legally, then they said that it would take longer and it's not that efficient. But why would you use coercion legally then? We still don't use it, even, even if they see the coercion as such an awesome method and it gives us so much efficiency. We don't do it. And that leads, um, leads me to uh, my material. About like um, oh sorry one point about before that sorry and um, they speak about how uh, people will get rewards and that's fine like even if we like they counteract with the whole idea of how these people get harms and then they get rewards we don't really like think that it's still fair we give rewards to people who have wrongly prosecuted for 20 years in prison the only reason why we give rewards is that we cannot really give those 20 years back that does not mean that it's in, in any way proportional to what these people have lost the same with coercion people who cannot enter the country need to leave their families etc etc. Now my material. Um, so firstly, um, let's look at why we overall don't coerce people, our own citizens or people like generally, why we think coercion is a wrong idea and deception as well. We think that we ultimately have a due process and we, are, we acknowledge that there are people and we acknowledge the situation where we need to contract, but we have a process that we've figured out in order to do so. Why that is so in order to um, grant people with the rights, but also their protection. We think that, like, why the reason why we don't have police states and cameras in every home and why we don't coerce every, every person into doing things is because we generally take the principle that people are good and have not done anything wrong. That's why we don't go to people on the street and make them tell us everything, because if we would do that, then that would violate their rights too much. And most people, like, even, like, statistically have not done anything and that would not be proportional to that. We think that, like, we, the due process gives us a two points of proportionality, which is important. In the point of proportionality, proportionality about the ground in the sense that you need to have some kind of reason why you would inter why you would make people in a bad situation we think that we're speaking in this debate about cases where we don't actually have them the massive amounts of people who are being coerced or deceived simply because of the fact where they come from is not a ground enough for them to be subjected to a situation out of due process second part of proportionality comes from the idea of what we inflict to these people and what they've done to do so a we think that they haven't done anything so we've already is proportional, but furthermore, we inflict them to very clear harms. We put them in a situation where they, for example, have to sell out their family, sell out their friends, or not be allowed to a country where, for example, their daughter is in. I think that's a situation where you have very tangible harms for doing absolutely nothing but being from a certain country. So we think that coercion into that reason is wrong. Second reason why we think that we don't need, for example, in our states, we have most states have the idea that you are not you're not uh, obliged to to uh, testify against your wife or husband, for example. We do that because it's also a situation of two very bad choices. Why we protect these people in these situations is because they haven't chosen to be in those situations to begin with. These people are most innocent and cannot do anything and are in this bad situation. That's why we don't make them do stuff like that. And that's why we don't coerce people and deceive them because they are not to be blamed. Um, go. We also <coughs> prosecute the wife for complicity in, say, mob crimes of her husband, or offer her witness protection if she yeah. chooses to testify against her. That's a form of coercion. Yeah. Thank you. We offer them witness protection if they choose themselves to testify. That's fine. And we, we prosecute them if they know about stuff and haven't like done crimes in some circumstances. But ultimately, we think that we allow them the situation of not choosing to like wreck your whole life. We think that's important. Now, why we necessarily, uh, we think that we don't really do all of these things to foreigners because we think that people are equal and we shouldn't subject them to different things. But two very important reasons why we don't do that necessarily as well. We think that if these people enter our territory, then 
these people are subject to all of the laws that apply to us. But all of the laws and obligations correspond to specific rights. The specific rights which are different than the balance of how we grant rights and obligations different to all states, but it creates the idea of a perfect life where you can like be secure but also have liberties. We deny these people with that principle because we take away their rights because they don't really get them anymore. However, they still need to have the obligations, which means that they cannot have a humane and worthy life in our state. And lastly, we think that overall, if we do these things to our states, then ultimately these other states will do them to our people. So ultimately, by not coercing and deceiving people, we're actually protecting our own citizens. That's a good idea as well. First, thank you. use deception and why those are valid methods and probably the only valid method in that circumstance. And then I'm going to talk to you about why in order to access the valuable intelligence that we need, it has to be a West initiated towards the individual route and the individual who has the information has no capacity to come to the West with that information. I don't mean physically come to the West, I mean come to the representative of the West that's milling around in their country. But first, some rebuttal. Right. We get a lot from side government that coercion doesn't happen to Western citizens. And we'd say, on side hop, yeah, it does. If I offer a plea bargain to one member of the gang who rolls and testifies and all the other members of the gang order for a lighter sentence, I'm saying you can experience this negative consequence or you can do the thing I like, I am coercing your decision. If I offer an incentive to give some information about testifying against, uh, about giving information about a criminal act, say in terms of a monetary reward, I am offering you a good thing in exchange for you doing a thing I want, I think that's a coercion, right? We think that coercion generally means doing something to someone to make them do the thing that you want them to do. I didn't want to be here at 8.30 this morning, Susan told me I wouldn't be in the drawer if I wasn't, and so I was here. I don't want to go to work on Monday morning, I know that I will have no money on Friday if I don't, and so I will go to work on Monday morning. These are all forms of coercion, we think they're covered in the debate. We think them standing up and saying, no, we're only talking about violence, is like not a reasonable reason to constrain the debate. Like, they haven't told us why our other forms of coercion aren't good. No, thank you. You had chance, you had POIs. Right, so then we have like, well, the people that we're like dragging off the land at Heathrow don't have the information that we want. Fine, we will be more careful about who we drag off the line at Heathrow, right? We don't think we need to check everyone from Colombia in case they all have drugs. We think we can use fairly rigorous forms of intelligence. They're willing to concede that because they're willing to spy on them using like dragnet. Then they say we don't get valuable information in this way. And at that point we say, well, let's think of the value of human intelligence. And at this point, I'd like to draw your attention to the war on drugs. Because the manufacturing process of drugs, say marijuana in South Africa and Botswana, or uh, ecstasy through um, Ecuador and Mexico, like, that's not on an email trail. <laughs> that's not electronic. That's where in this specific bit of forest is that particular factory right now. Only local people know. Local people have a massive incentive to not tell the Mexican or Ecuadorian or South African government where those particular farms and factories are. If we offer them A, protection in terms of future security, a form of coercion, B, protection for their family, C, relocation to the West, and D, like, extra money. We think that they are more willing to come forward and, like, tell us things that we need to know in order to protect our citizens, no thank you, from the direct harm of taking cannabis or ecstasy that makes them become very unwell, dead, or just, like, not happy, right? One we think that we have to go. Right. If a person wants protection and doesn't like the drug gangs, for instance, and we're offering it to them, and they will have no repercussions of not taking it, it's not coercion by definition, it's just offering another alternative to make decisions. Right. But at the moment, the person doesn't want to come and give me that information. 
Because if I come and give you that information, I as an individual am at massive risk from the direct acts. And this is going on to like actually the bizarrely point number three, but let's like defect to point number three with the power balance, right? So if I as an individual have information that you as the Western government need, I don't necessarily know who I'm supposed to approach with that information. Now, in the Mexican drug situation, I think I'm responding to the previous one, I might be able to guess that it could be a local police officer, but there's a strong chance that he's corrupt. If I'm in an Eastern government, like a, um, a Far Eastern government, and I have, um, say, business or um, technology intelligence that I wish to share, I don't know who in the embassy I'm supposed to talk to, because I don't know which one is the intelligence officer and which one is generally like the arts attaché, right? So the Western person has to be the one to approach either the Chinese businessman with the, with the technological data or have, like, some way of approaching the individual Mexican citizen. Because the cost to those individuals of getting it wrong is so high that they won't do it on their own. The cost we think is in terms of status, in terms of like potential debt from the gangs, in terms of like all sorts of bad things that we don't think we need to necessarily span out, right? So no thinking. So we don't think we get access to that information if we require it to come bottom up. So it has to come top down. And then if you well, thank you, I'm still responding to your partner. If I then give the information to the person and then go back to my home in the Mexican village or back to my like job in the Chinese embassy, and I don't have some form of ability to become future secure or future protected or have that monetary incentive that we've offered through the coercion to like make that person do it if they didn't necessarily initially want to because we need that intelligence. Right? They weren't thinking, oh, I will go and have this chat on my own because I'm such a massive moral individual. Some of them exist, but most of them don't. We have to use support of force. If I don't offer them some protection, there is no reason for them to do it because they know that the consequence otherwise is like, if I tell them, I will go home, I will die, and my family will die because the Mexican drug lords will kill them. Right? We think that that's reasonable. So, continuing to run down the bottom, I'm sorry, this is turning into a slightly chaotic speech, right? They say that there are more objections to torture. Um, opening says like, that there is a cost-benefit analysis, and we're like, quite willing to buy into that. And then they say that foreign people have less access to, to legal means of recourse in these situations. And we say, well, quite frankly, these foreign people often aren't in countries. Like, the Mexican villager is not in the West. We can't use our legal methods. The Mexican villager who has the information about where the thing is, is in Mexico. And we think we need to use, no, thank you. We need to use that coercion. And then they say it's going to cause an, um, an, a negative interaction between governments. And we say it's the status quo. And we say, that look at the way this is working in South Africa already. It's encouraging cooperation. No thank you between us and South African governments. But then let's get back to point one, which is now point God knows what, like types of coercion. And why different types of coercion are reasonable and should be covered in this debate, right? We think that any action that influences another person to do the thing that I want them to do, that they otherwise wouldn't do, and that otherwise is probably not in their best interest, is a form of coercion. We think sometimes we have to compensate those forms of coercion in terms of offering future security. We think sometimes we dangle visas in front of people in Iraq so that they become translators for us. We think sometimes we offer like large sums of money to people who are willing to sell us information that we need. We think we need that information for various reasons, like I've told you about the war on drugs, and I've earlier talked to you about the war on terror, right? We think there are specific circumstances where deceiving and lying are mandatory and necessary. And at this point, we're thinking about, to go back to the terrorist example, undercover agents planted within ISIS, right? We have no way of accessing that information from ISIS without having like, a little pretend ISIS agent who is going around actively lying to every single person that he sees at all times, right? They met that out by saying, like, lying is not allowed. They don't met that out. They define that out by saying, like, lying is not allowed. We think that at that point, lying is necessary in order to have information about what's going on. We think we lie to our own citizens. We think we use plea bargaining as a form of coercion. We speech, which summarizes the nature of the Western government taking. Firstly, I'm going to talk about terminology. I'm going to define coercion, distinguish it from infiltration, bargaining, and all these other phenomena that the second opposition talks about, and then go into the crucial questions. Firstly, is this necessary and is this proportional? Something that Christian told about in the second opposition never responded to. Secondly, I will discuss whether it's fair and thirdly, whether it's harmful. Does it bring more benefits in the, under the criteria of human rights being protected or not? 
But firstly, let's get into the definition part. Firstly, they say that we already reduce coercion on our people, bringing an example that if I am a drug lord, for instance, they can plea bargain with me to give out other drug uh, cartel members. Now, distinguish, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that this is legitimate coercion for a very specific reason. We have all, that person has made an active choice of already breaking the rules of that country, which does not allow you to be a drug cartel owner or a, 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 a dealer, basically. Meaning that your active choice has put you in a position where the state can legitimately, legitimately prosecute you, right? So in that position, it's completely legit for the state to give you also another bad option. For instance, give out other members but receive a lesser sentence. Notice, and the importance of this is that which either one of the bad choices is legitimate because of your active actions. And that is not the case, for instance, if I just happen to randomly be born in a Middle Eastern country that has been stigmatized by your random Western states foreign policy for a decade, and then I just want to travel to see my family in the United States because I finally got enough money to go there, and then I'm allowed, allowed on the basis of my random birth. That is not equal. Secondly, they say, well, but locals don't want to give us information on drug cartels, and this is something where we, uh, we offer them protection, hence this is coercion. That is by definition, again, not coercion, because we are not putting them in too bad position. If they decide not to tell me where that factory is in exchange for protection, they will not be in a worse off position than they were before my interaction, because they are not in the threat by being killed by a drug cartel, right? If they do tell me where that drug cartel is having their hazard factory, they are in a, th a threatening position, and that is logical that we offer them protection in exchange for that information. But we are not putting them in face of a choice that has two worse outcomes than they would. Why does this happen on the proposition bench what we try to abolish is if a person travels to a Western state and you force them to give out inf personal information about your loved ones or a community, a, you deny him or her a visa or a no, put them, them on a no-fly list or something else that is damaging the individual, or B, even if they tell you, you put them at risk by going back home because they will be seen as a traitor and will not be given by ISIS recruiters already uh, near their family or loved ones, regardless of which state we're talking about. So you are actively creating a position where an individual has, has an illegitimate choice, like you have no right to put them in that position, but you put them in a position where they have no good options. Then they talked about Chinese businessmen, which also kind of falls under the same logic that I already explained. The idea that if you offer them money, they can take that money in their protection, and that is their active choice. But if they don't take that money, they won't be in a worse off position before you interfered in the situation. Because then the Chinese government, if they didn't give out information, would have no reason to harass them in the first place. Then they talked about ISIS, uh, ISIS recruits, so we need people inside ISIS to get intel. Yes, we have legitimate grounds to think ISIS is bad because crucifying minorities is something that we universally deem abhorrent. That gives us legitimate grounds for deception because there is probable doubt that they have already committed acts and we need proportional infringement on that individual right to privacy who is involved in ISIS crucifixions to actually get them down. Whereas, if you sit down, please, if I, me and Kristen form a debate club and there is no reasonable doubt that you and that we have done anything wrong, it would be not okay for private for the state to interfere fear on our business and deceive us or coerce us to give out, out information if you don't have probable doubt. So these current situations are not comparable. But let's get into the talks of the Sure. You just said that there are times when it is reasonable to use deception. Your top half says that there are no times when it is reasonable to use deception or violence. Which one is true? We are both talking about the same cases. We think if we're talking about harassing or coercing foreign citizens in cases where you don't have legal means to do so, it's never justified and logical. And this is what I'm getting into. They, the basic of opposition bench lies, and I think this is crucial. Notice that this is not a taking time bomb scenario, right? This is people traveling from one country and one continent to another, right? We are saying that A, you won't get, you won't get useful information as the first proposition already pointed out, B, like you have incentives to lie and so on and so forth, but most of all, you are creating a worse situation in terms of national security. Now, why is that? It's basically because you are doing something unfair to them, <laughs> and that is creating a moral precedent. Although the opposition wants to talk about foreign citizens per se, we are also more and more cracking down on people who are citizens of the Western countries, both ethnicities or foreign ethnicities, right? Why is that? So it's very easy because you create a moral precedent. The more people feel that threat, and they are increasingly feeling that threat because we demonize terrorism and blow it up as a big thing, right? They are able to then mediate between moral absolutes. If you have a very strict idea and moral Quran to understand that you will never infringe individual rights, that hard line is much harder to bend 
when, uh, in comparison to situations where you have a precedence that in cases of some arbitrary security, whether it's liberty cases, on basing or, or basing on ethnicity, it's okay to then we create a precedent in which you can uh, attack personal rights. This is the disproportionate infringement on two grounds that Christian told you. This is on the grounds that you have an assumption to infringe and they have never proven to us why a person who is of certain ethnicity and traveling to see their family, whether it's in the Middle East or at the United States, you should infringe this privacy. And secondly, why it's proportional. Why it's probable that most of these people who are put into position, whether they don't see their family or give out information that puts them at risk, is something that will give us very vital information to prevent loss of human life. We do not think that in most cases that is the case. And we defend the idea that it's better that one guilty person walks free than we, that, that we jail 10 innocent people, right? And that is the general philosophy that the Western states are built upon and we support. Why is that fair? That is fair because individual rights are the premise of why we need states in the first place, right? We have to system, uh, if we have systematic infringement of state or into individual lives, we demolish that principle. We only need states and rights so we can have our individual autonomy and self-actualization. But if that self-actualization is abolished by the idea that each and every one of those rights is constantly infringed on the excuse that there's something bad might happen to another person, that it overall overrides the idea of why we need rights in the first place. So we think that even if and they have not, they proved to us that one more terrorist attack will happen, that does not overweigh the harm of systematic harassment of citizens of foreign countries and or ethnicities, right? So what we are saying is, because that will radicalize them, that, that feeds into the ISIS narrative, which is that Western states are hypocritical, they, do, they mouthwash your religion, they think you are lesser, meaning that if that person even before wasn't radical, now if they see that it's true and is denied access to his or her family or homeland, they are much more likely to take up the ISIS flag and fight the state that has done this personal infringement and disobeyed his or her wishes. Please propose. sometimes necessary and why is it effective and why is deception sometimes needed and why is it effective. Firstly, first of just like some issues I have with the previous which we just case where he literally says well sometimes it's okay to use coercion and sometimes it's okay to use deception just not in very specific cases such as like pulling someone out of an airport line. Unfortunately the big way I have it isn't isn't this house would like this house believes that the West should not pull people out of their airport lines and coerce them or deceive them. This is to say that all foreign nationals, right? If you say to them, okay, well, these foreign nationals were okay to coerce and deceive, then frankly, we win the debate. You just admit it's yes, okay to coerce and deceive people. Like, I don't quite see why why this not would ever not be okay. Sort of thing. Like, frankly, it's saying, fine, if you want us to be more selective, that we pull out cues in Heathrow, we'll do that sort of thing. That's fine, you know, we still are happy, but we still need to admit that we can, like, Coercive to see other people who aren't in this queue, I think we win the debate on those grounds. But just in case we don't, I'll go into it a bit more detail now. So, first of all, does the info work and why? So, I mean, like, this idea that, oh, apparently, you know, the info we get is never useful, so I think, you know, we, we don't need information from other states. When, like, clearly we do need info from other states, and clearly, like, info that we can get is useful in the fact that they're still going to use other kind of, like, security means, or something, such as dragons, such as, like, other sorts of things. Also, like using other like reading people's emails without their knowledge, I'm pretty sure is a form of deception. Like right? when they think that their emails are going unread, but you're actually reading them, that's a deception where they're being deceived about the privacy of their email. You still probably can't do that. But, you know, even doing your best when you can, you are still admitting to us we still need information, we still have to find out about these threats, there are still threats to us, sort of thing. And it's clear at this point that we are still gathering information. So all of your cases about like apparently how we'll get so much like international goodwill and the fact that we now no longer look at people's information, we now apparently trust people much more. 
just falls falls on those grounds, sort of thing. I think we're still like winning the case, winning the debate in this case. No, thank you. Second point: Why is coercion necessary? I'm going to talk about what Reid point now. So what Ree said to us is that basically sometimes it's very hard to find who the right person to talk to is. What does he mean? So basically, like, let's look at a situation. Let's use the, the drug cartel example that we've been using, okay? What is more likely to happen? What is more likely to get us information? Us going out to members of the drug cartel and saying to them, right, if you tell us information about like, your pirates from your organization, if you give us information about all these things and you could not normally get there, thank you. Sort of thing. We will, you know, like make sure that your family is protected from ramifications. We will like kind of set you up in like a nice part of America where you're safe and give you and give you like basically a, a visa to live there. We'll, like basically make sure, make it worth your while to give us this information, give us this information helpful. Is this more is it more like to get us for us to get information from that? Or us just waiting around, kicking our heels, and expecting magically some person in a drug cartel is probably out getting like relatively high amounts of money and they're probably still maybe concerned about the data there, but ultimately isn't like these kind of like things to suddenly have a crisis and can't just go, you know what? I'm gonna risk imprisonment, I'm gonna risk being killed by gamblers, I'm gonna risk uh, like I'm gonna risk like gut corrupt policemen catching me, I'm gonna like risk all of these things and try and hunt down exactly the right person in the organization to go and talk to and ask and, like ask and offer my help to them. And then like, you know, and then but then, but then like it's, it's been told to us and it's been made very well known that apparently you know, the West doesn't use coercion deception, so it's unlikely I'm actually going to get any reward, I'm necessarily going to be safe. But you know, I'm still definitely going to come forward at that point and tell them information. Strangely enough, I can't see this happening, I'll take opening and tell me why. Okay, so the negotiation you talk about, first of all, isn't coercion and deception. But more than that, why, is, why are we unable to provide safe spaces for individuals to talk about, such as like the visa interview room on our side of the house, so that we can have these discussions with the correct officials? I mean, I'm sorry, like, throughout this debate you kind of keep saying to us, oh, you know, it's not coercion, you've never fully explained why it's not coercion, you've never, like, you kind of said, oh, well, it's a transaction, oh, well, you know, it's bribery, sort of thing, like, we explained to you many times, we've given you many examples, we've literally given you the definition of coercion, that's what Reed did in her speech, saying that coercion is when you are, when you are given incentive to do something that you would not normally do, sort of thing, frankly, just kind of say, just repeat to us, say, well, it's not coercion, and not, it's not engagement, it's just basically you going, just, you just start trying to ignore our material that we're giving you, that's not how debating works, and thank you. Okay, third point of deception, and this used to something that, like, had not been talked about that much in the debate until we came in, and something that is still very important. So, we told you that when we have, like, these things like ISIS, when we have, like, these organisations in other countries that, unfortunately, we don't know much about, like actually don't use like many kind of like um, digital medias or use the internet to, to transfer information because frankly it's quite stupid because obviously you're not going to get much information so we can't get the information that apparently we get and that's our house with their drag and stuff. Generally what we want to do is put in an undercover operative or put in someone who can like talk to them and try and get information from those people without their knowledge. It becomes far harder to do that when we are suddenly not allowed to use deception and our operatives, first thing they have to do, rather than kind of, you know, trying to get themselves ingrained into the system, try and like go through, try and talk to people, try and like, make contacts within that, because like they have to, dis and unfortunately, yes, deceive them in not immediately telling them who they are and why they're there, suddenly that becomes a lot harder when their first action now has to be, oh, I'm an American operative, I'm trying to get information about ISIS. Strangely enough, I don't think that many people are willing to talk to them, strangely. And so what then happens? Well, what then happens is that we don't get information we can't like get any information about like things like ISIS, which I think like is probably going to cause a lot of people to die. And like when we can't get information about how to deal with it and how to like kind of like challenge ISIS, and even like to get information to give to other groups who like are going to be innocent parties and possibly you know if you know ISIS are moving into a certain place and you can get information to that place and try and get people to you know make themselves safer, and that's probably a good thing. No, thank you. Something. But even then, like you know, just getting information that's even personal just to your country. When you want to get information about future terrorist attacks that could save many lives, right? And we think this is a good thing that you can get on our side of the house by unfortunately, yes, deceiving a few people who are part of a pretty horrific organization, like sad times, but ultimately we believe that them like being a bit deceiving, being a bit silly, because you know the American trick them is a bit better than having to explain to hundreds and hundreds of people why their families have now been killed, why lots of people are now dead, and why, you know, ISIS is still going on, we still know nothing more about it, just because we're not willing to deceive people. You know, so, as I said, our entire side of the house, we've given you examples where coercion and where deception are useful. We've explained what we mean by coercion and deception, we've explained why the, why the proposition just kind of like saying to us, that's not coercion, isn't true, that, and we've explained why it is coercion, we've explained, basically put, Government have told us that there is one. They even have told us there are specific situations where using coercion and deception are okay. I'm lying to you. 
frankly, I think on all of those grounds, we really have to win the debate because ultimately, the government have not told us why it is effective to not use Soviet prison and deception.